first, there were eyes on the street, and now there are eyes in the skies. The director of national intelligence has given the go-ahead for the nation's spy satellites to be used regularly by U.S. civilian agencies and law enforcement. This is a, a development all Americans should have great pride in because it expands and uses a national technical systems, which we've built for tens of billions of dollars over many decades. Spy satellites have primarily been used overseas to monitor things like war zones and terror training camps. They've also been used domestically, but sparingly, during events including Super Bowl games, presidential inaugurals, and hurricanes. Homeland Security officials say the satellites will now be used to protect borders and critical infrastructure. Which includes ports and looking at potential uh, vulnerabilities and the and threats as well as consequences of attacks. Next in line, law enforcement agencies, which are expected to start using them next year. While they can provide crucial high-resolution images, there are limits to what these satellites can do. They can't see faces and they can't listen. At least that's what the government claims. But privacy groups worry that because there's so much we don't know about their capabilities, they could be misused and we wouldn't even know it. The question always comes down to what are the standards, are there checks and balances, and is this a power that we would trust the executive branch to use without any outside scrutiny or oversight or control? Homeland Security officials insist that they are subject to a great amount of oversight and review, but in many ways this is just one more case of the government figuring it out as it goes in the war on terror. Kelly Arena, CNN, Washington. Now, files declassified in America have revealed covert republic relations and lobbying activities of Israel in the U.S. The National Archive made the documents public following a Senate investigation. They suggest Israel has been trying to shape media coverage of issues it regards as important. You can download these files from the website of the Institute for Research on Middle Eastern Policy. And we can now cross to Washington and talk to Grant F. Smith, who is the director of this institute. Thank you for joining Joining us, Mr. Smith, I'd like to begin by asking you, what exactly do these files reveal? These files are from a sealed Senate investigation, which uh, was the result of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the U.S. Department of Justice looking into groups that brought $36 million into the U.S. to plant stories in the U.S. media and promote Israeli foreign policy objectives in the United States. Uh, they're extremely relevant because they revealed, for example, a vast effort to divert U.S. attention from the Israeli Dimona nuclear weapons facility by saying it was merely a research center. Uh, they carefully tracked how that story was playing in the U.S. media. And they also uh, were using outlets such as the Atlantic magazine, funneling $50,000 into that magazine in a major effort to disrupt a U.S. peace proposal, which would have involved bringing some Palestinian refugees and allowing them to return to their homes and properties uh, in Israel. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about these... Go ahead. I was just going to say, what about the, the media, their side? How susceptible are they to Israeli lobbying? Well, this reveals uh, essentially that major U.S. publications that were on the receiving end of the $36 million uh, really fell into line for a whole host of initiatives. Now, the Senate investigation was a failure. And they essentially uh, heavily censored the Senate transcript and then put all of these extremely damning files uh, into sealed records uh, for, for years and years so that nobody could really see what was going on. Uh, and unfortunately, the groups that were involved in this, they were ultimately forced to re register as foreign agents and disclose their activities. They simply transferred all of these activities into a group called the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Um, so it's extremely enlightening for Americans to see how media influence uh, functions uh, by looking at internal documents from this investigation. Well, it also makes you ask how much will Americans really see if the U.S. media is so affected by these lobbyists, no? Well, yeah, that, that's exactly the case because once again, you know, we're, we're replaying history. Now, instead of trying to divert attention away from nuclear weapons in the Middle East, 
uh, a magazine. Again, The Atlantic is on the forefront of, a, of an APAC drive to get the United States uh, to attack uh, Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, again, now under the pretext that they're nuclear weapons sites. So it, it, for, for the United States, uh, it's, it's extremely important for people to see this media influence and the mechanics of it because over the passage of time this has only gotten worse. What does this suggest about U.S. policy in the Middle East? Is it being shaped around the interest of Israel as you see it? Well, we've done a lot of work over the years obtaining documents uh, about Israeli policy initiatives in the United States. And the documentary record suggests a heavy influence on the part of Israeli politicians and various parastatal groups that work tightly with Israel without disclosing those relationships. Uh, and ha they have successfully built a campaign financing system in the United States that's extremely effective at pushing Israeli objectives by withholding or dispersing campaign funding to U.S. politicians. So there is a high degree of control that's in place, but for, for your average American, it's almost completely hidden. Interesting stuff. Grant F. Smith, Director of the Institute for Research on Middle Eastern Policy, thank you very much for your time.